I guess right at the start, it was a big risk mm -hmm. that was sending 500 students into a disaster zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so civil defence, we tried to sort of limit it, and a lot of internal council staff said, you've got to shut this down. Mm -hmm. And it was the mayor that said, no, I think we can use this for something. We've mm -hmm. just got to put the, the energy in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, civil defence and council staff weren't of that opinion. And Alan Wilson arrived one day as the West Coast Civil Defence Manager and sort of came at the last minute to a meeting and took, got given a folder, like, here, deal with this which was these students in this Facebook page, and he had a print-off of the Facebook page that had the numbers on there, and he thought, you know, um, oh this has an excellent chance to turn to custard. <laughs> uh, and we worked very closely together, and it didn't, which is great. But equally, on that first day, when, when I was rung and said, oh, you know, we're going to take over and run this, I was like, great, that's great. Uh, we don't know what we're doing. You guys have trained for this. <laughs> <laughs> and the volunteers stood around for an hour and a half. But we all signed into a little notebook and then had them divert into teams and go out and sort of wander around the streets for a while. And a lot of the volunteers were getting really annoyed. And of course, that frustration doesn't go back to the civil defence, it goes back to us on our Facebook page. Abuse on the Facebook page, people just outrightly saying, you know, why aren't you guys time. more audience? Why, sorry, why aren't you guys more organised? Why aren't you, you know, can't you sort this out? Do you actually, are you actually going to be ready for us tomorrow? That sort of thing happens instantly. And it happens from the field when they're there on their, on their cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so we, and we sort of took over the more of the management of it. Um, pretty soon after that, like, we'll, we'll actually deal with everything with students. You can tell us where to go or what to do, if anything. I guess I was quite surprised that there wasn't a clear avenue for spontaneous volunteers to be coordinated, as it was so natural for me and so many people I knew to want to help. And I completely respect civil defence in the way that you know, they were focused on the, the real emergency. They are a high-risk public safety organisation, and that's what the legislation says. But in fact, the, the welfare of everyday residents, uh, and even if they don't act, they're not actually in high risk and they've got enough food and water to survive, having someone go and knock on their door and, uh, and help them shovel their sills and, and take them a muffin or a cup of tea, that, that means so much. And that's one of the, that was the big lessons we learnt between September and February. Mm. Spontaneous volunteers, this unknown entity, it's, it's terrifying for people trying to focus on something, knowing that something else might be happening on the side that they have no control over. The name army didn't actually come in until January, and uh, we were known more commonly within authorities as the siltworms uh, back, in, back in, <laughs> in September. The police called us siltworms, so did the fire, and the, the army didn't really know what to think of us. From that very first day, essentially the brief was knock on the door, introduce yourself and ask if they need help. And so we'd literally just show up and knock on the door and ask if they need help. And the fact that you're there, fresh-faced, young, energetic, and offering help, the response was just incredible. People were just <laughs> delighted, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely over the moon <laughs> to see us, which was, uh, it was, a, it was an interesting change, um, certainly from some of the encounters we'd had with all of our neighbours, with parties and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the community was pretty happy to see us most of the time. I think it's changed the way a lot of people look at students and the value that young people bring to to communities. And yes, we party. Yes, there's a lot of sort of drunkenness that happens. That is that you know it's really anti-social social in, in many respects, and it it's a really it kills a lot of communities. But the other side, when push comes to shove, a lot of young people actually have incredible skills that they're more than willing to put into into different areas. And one of the big things that we, we've talked about a lot is, uh, I guess, in the, sort of the leadership ar around this, it was just creating the alternative to a party on Facebook. And that's really how the page actually came about. I was invited to three or four earthquake after parties. You know, university's fallen down, why not have a party? <laughs> uh, well, actually, let's try and do something more constructive with this time that we've got off. John Hartnell from the Farming Army, I think, summarised it very well recently. And he said, you know, that younger generations are often, you know, our generation maybe sort of scoffed at a wee bit because we can't manoeuvre a piece of number eight wire as well as what maybe our fathers or you know, grandfathers could because of the practical skills they had. When in fact, he argued that we can, and I completely agree, except instead of using, using an actual piece of number eight wire, our Kiwi ingenuity may be making, building something out of computer code and pasting it on Facebook, mm -hmm. rather than actually with a, something else. So it's just a different, using the different tools in our pockets. We're so lucky to have Facebook and Twitter and Bebo and Gmail and, and Google Maps and, and everything else that we, we can, that we can use effortlessly to coordinate ourselves. At the end of the day, the Student Volunteer Army wasn't some, some amazing organisation that did something revolutionary. Mm -hmm. It was like a Easter or sale in a rural community. Somebody brings the bailer, somebody notes the, donates the paddock of peas and somebody brings the lunch, and somebody brings the tea and everyone just does it together And because you've got a very simple, clear purpose. You're mm -hmm. creating bales to sell. We were shoveling silt to look after people. It was actually great the way the Facebook page worked. 
the whole way through, particularly in, in February. Some people yep. who couldn't, maybe had young children or couldn't come out and volunteer, but there were posts. You know, we had Gina and Jade, their full-time job was monitoring the Facebook page and just running and the it. emails. And the emails. Yeah. The emails, jeepers. <laughs> the, um, you know, 27,000 people on the Facebook page. That needed a lot of work, and it was very high turnover of you know, there's mm. over a million uh, interactions on a, on a sort of over a two-week period. Mm. Uh, and so people would post, I need help, and people would like, oh, I need help, I want a carpool, and... Some people would just sit at home quite naturally and actually just respond to all the comments and mm-hmm. say, well, this is what the information says, because we'd post the information in the inf- information section. Sometimes that wouldn't be transferred to the, the wall of, mm-hmm. of posts, and so people would just take their own initiative with that, which was great, another mm-hmm. role that people organically filled. And there were students from Canterbury, students from Lincoln, students from CPIT, and a lot of just general community members. Um, and, and the team that I was working really closely with, we had about five or six people about my parents' age, Um, And then we had our students on dispatch stuff who were sending out their lecturers, giving their lecturers instructions who would go out and and shovel stuff. So it was really cool. You had whole families coming in. It really was just a cross-section of the community. And it was kind of a shame that that the name Student Volunteer was there, Student Volunteer Army, was there because so many people thought, I'm not a student, I I shouldn't go down. And people thought that they couldn't get involved because they weren't a student. The biggest challenge was finding more work to do because they worked so fast, so efficient, and there wasn't always enough silt in the right area. So you had to have to move the students around or direct them somewhere new and feed them. I can remember peeling myself out of bed on 5 a.m. to go and set things up. And it all, we all did the same. We had like stayed up to 2 o'clock the night before, mapping out the buses and making sure it's all sorted, then really having two hours sleep and then peeling yourself out of bed to make sure it runs the next day. A German tourist who was stay, staying in his van and I used to go and sleep in his van for an hour during the day or sleep in the truck on the way up to the eastern suburbs because <laughs> after two weeks of it we just I couldn't, we just weren't functioning. There were some pretty great stories of coming back from the major lunchtime delivery because when you've got a thousand people out it's a big undertaking getting all the food to them and coming back and Sam would be asleep in the truck and they'd get back to base and then they'd just go for another drive and get back and then they'd wake them up. Yeah. <laughs> we, we just got exhausted and that was actually dangerous. We were we worked too much and we, we I guess we didn't have the experience or the knowledge of civil defence and of an organisation to recognise that burnout and recognise that actually we need to train identify roles and have those roles rotate. Instead, mm-hmm. we had individual people mm-hmm. involved in different departments. And so while we say we've got titles, you know, Erin was in charge of the tent and Mike was in charge of sponsorship and Jason was in charge of the mobile management and Jonas was in charge of the IT. Mm. If any one of those people left, <laughs> heavens, it would stop. Mm. So we had to rely on those individual people for a long period of time. And while that's changed now, mm. back then, you, you had to go hop up and do your job. But it wasn't, it wasn't exactly it wasn't enforced. It was written down that this person reports to this person and goes up, but it was just the, naturally the way it worked. Mm. Yeah. Everyone had, took, took on personal responsibility, mm-hmm. and I guess from the organisational and leadership side of it, we had to trust that responsibility and accept the consequences that came with it mm-hmm. because you didn't have those management structures in place like a business or anything. It was organic that somebody would take, be in charge of, uh, we needed sponsorship to buy wheelbarrows. So the sponsorship team would, would take that on and say, we'll, we'll find money. And then the logistics team to actually move the move the wheelbarrows, the team to build the wheelbarrows and the team to transport them to suburbs, and then the team to transport them back and clean them and stack them and get them all ready for the next day. But each one of those people, each one of those teams, if one of them let their side down or decided not to show up, it would cause significant problems. Mm. But So you, 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 you assume that risk by having them involved, but actually the important part is giving them that responsibility mm. and letting them go on their leadership journey as well. To, to actually, this, you know, this is my job, this is what I do, and uh, if we need to um, expand or do something different, uh, we can do that as well, and we know that it's just common sense. And the whole operation, over, over 80,000 hours of volunteer work mm. in February alone, of February and March, uh, was cost $59,000, which included transport, food, uh, all the logistics, all the equipment and everything. I mean, a lot of that was donated, but in dollar terms, we had cost a very little amount of money to actually make work. We relied on trust, building relationships and the goodwill of people. Mm-hmm. And often in a disaster, people are, well, don't have a lot of money to give, but they'll give their resources or their product or their time. But often I found the, uh, the systems, uh, the strict emergency management systems, and even within large NGOs, they don't have the ability or the capacity to deal with those donations. Whether it is 75,000 lunches from Dunedin or a busload of food from up north or, or a truckload, or a container load of plastic water carriers from Japan, they arrive, they, they want to give them, they're here, who, who coordinates them? And that was a large thing that we did by just saying yes to just about everything that came along mm-hmm. and then setting up a small team to go and deal with that. 
The t-shirts were donated actually by Mr. Vintage for a start. He gave us a few thousand and then we got a few thousand more and, uh, and ordered them through him and just thought well, green t-shirt works well and uh, and Fulton Hogan came on board and actually gave us a whole lot of hats. Be because the students didn't have any sort of ID or accreditation and they were going to people's homes and a lot of people were vulnerable, we wanted to, people to identify themselves. They are the students, they're with us. Mm -hmm. They're here to do a job and people shouldn't be scared of seeing, um, seeing a couple of people roaming around the streets wearing these t-shirts. And so it was much about that identity in the street that was very important, as well as actually giving the, giving the students something that they can take home and say, you know, this is what you re 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 rewarding this. It was quite interesting back at the base actually giving out the T-shirts, because some people would say, oh, I've only been here for a couple of days, I, I don't deserve one yet. It's like, come on. <laughs> Take two. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about the volunteer army. It's not a mass of people. It's not a thousand people who can go and do a job any time. It's a, it's a pattern of communication. Mm. Your words, actually. Um, yeah, pattern of communication to coordinate volunteers in a disaster. And so in those first stages, it was such a delicate ecosystem. And it, so it, was, it was in many ways quite lucky that it did sort of take off. Mm -hmm. Um, but then in saying that, I think that in a disaster situation, people need to realise that actually what you can do, even on a very small scale, is the most valuable. Mm -hmm. And you don't need the permission of civil defence or council. You can go and help in a community somewhere, and it's just like being a good neighbour, except you're doing it on the other side of town. Yeah. And at grassroots, that's all we did. And that's the message that it's about getting out. It's not hard. There's nothing difficult about it. You just, once again, you just got to do something. What do you think should be done? You do mm -hmm. it. Partnership, working together is good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're all heading the same direction, yeah. guys. Let's just hold hands. Yeah. <laughs>